This afternoon, I want to talk to you about Friedrich Johann Karl Lochner, who was one of the great figures of the first, I would say, first half century of the Missouri Synod. Uh, he is the author, his monium opus, he uh, was the author of a number of books, but his monium opus is this that I have in my hand, Der Hauptgottesdienst der Evangelisch Lutherischen Kirche, which was published by Concordia Publishing House in 1895. And we have with us this afternoon uh, Matthew Carver. Now, where did Matthew go? Oh, there he is, way in the back. Matthew Carver, who has translated this book. Uh, it was supposed to have been published in time for the Synodical Convention. Now we hear it may be ready by Christmas, but we simply live in hope. And what is so wonderful about this book is that it not only includes text, but it includes musical settings for the entire Hauptgottesdienst, the Mass, and more of that as we go on. Friedrich Johann Karl Lochner was born in Nuremberg on September 23, uh, 1822. His father was a copper plate printer, but for 300 years there had been clergymen in the Lochner family. As a young man, he entered the studio of a noted copper plate engraver, but he became interested in music and took lessons from the organist at the St. Sebaldus Church in Nuremberg. But reading mission periodicals enkindled in Lochner a desire to be a missionary. In the year 1841, Friedrich Wieneken was in Germany to gather support for work among the German immigrants in North America. Lochner heard him speak at a meeting in Fürth and decided that he must go to North America. Lochner's parents were reluctant to have him do this, and so for a time Lochner studied to be a teacher. But finally, his parents, his parents agreed to let him enter the missionary training program of Wilhelm Lea in Neuen Dettelsaal. This took place in the fall of 1844. And while studying there, he made the acquaintance of Friedrich Hommel, who in several volumes made available the music treasures of the old Lutheran church. Lea's missionary training program for his so-called Sentlinge uh, lasted just a year, just a year. And at the end of that time, missionary friends of Lochner in Mecklenburg helped finance his journey to America. They included a certain Baron von Maltzahn and the Grand Duke Friedrich Franz of Mecklenburg. Lochner joined a group of Franconians and sailed from Bremen on April the 20th, 1845. Arriving in New York City, Lochner and his companions made their way to Monroe, Michigan, where they were received by Pastor William Hutchstedt, whom Leah had sent to America one year before. Six weeks later, Lochner received a call to a small congregation in Toledo, Ohio, and on August the 10th, 1845, he was ordained by pastors Hotstedt, Kronenwet, and Schmidt. Lochner's pastorate in Toledo was brief because he discovered that the congregation was not really Lutheran, but in fact a union congregation. And so from December 1846 to June 1850, Lochner served several con country congregations in Illinois at Pleasant Ridge, Edwardsville, and Collinsville. But, but already in September 1845, a number of Leah men in the Ohio Synod met in Cleveland. 
there formally to separate themselves from the Ohio Synod because of its lack of faithfulness to the Lutheran confessions in general and because of its unionistic communion practice in particular. What was also very important was this group's determination to contact the Saxon Lutherans in Missouri, since Leia himself had counseled his Sentlinge to make contact with the Saxons. And so in the spring of 1846, Wilhelm Seeler, who was then pastor of St. Paul's in Fort Wayne, together with Adam Ernst, who was the first of Leia's Sentlinge, and Lochner traveled to St. Louis, where they were cordially received by Dr. Walther, who invited Lochner to preach on the afternoon of Ascension Day. Uh, this is an interesting little vignette. Lochner, in fact, had a personal stake in the outcome of his preaching on Ascension Day because Seeler had advised Lochner, who was still a bachelor, to court Walther's sister-in-law, Lydia Binger. According to Lochner family tradition, Lydia's mother would not give her consent to the marriage until she had heard Lochner preach <laughs> and thereby determined whether or not Lochner could properly provide for her daughter's spiritual well-being. Well, Mrs. Binger apparently liked what she heard on Ascension Day, for on the following Sunday, Lydia's engagement to Lochner was announced and one week later, Friedrich and Lydia were married. It would be lovely to say they lived happily ever after, but that was not the case because just three years later, Lydia died on March the 12th, 1848, as a consequence of the birth of a little daughter who also died just three months later. So Lochner found himself a widower in his 20s. But a year later, in February 1849, Lochner married one Maria Bema, an old friend of Lydia, who bore Lochner 10 children. She sadly died of typhoid fever during Lochner's first year in Springfield where he was pastor of Trinity Church and instructor at the Springfield Seminary. After five years as a widower, Lochner married Maria von Halgwitz, who came from an old family of the Silesian nobility. She bore him three sons, Martin, Louis, and William. Louis uh, was a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, journalist. Uh, he was in Germany in Hitler's day and until we got into the war in World War II. His memoirs, uh, always the unexpected, are delightful and fascinating. But we're getting way ahead of ourselves, so we have to go back to the Saxons and the events leading to the foundation of our synod. In his study of Lochner's life, Cameron McKenzie has this to say. Although Lochner was present neither at the Constitutional Convention held in Fort Wayne in July 1846, nor at Synod's first convention the following year in Chicago, by his participation in the first two preliminary meetings, by making a positive impression upon the Saxons and not least by forging a personal union with Walther's family, uh, Friedrich Lochner became one of the founders of our synod. Mackenzie notes that during all his years as a pastor, which continued until less than a month before his death in February 1902 at the age of 79 years, Lochner in his ministry demonstrated three characteristics, faithfulness to the Lutheran confessions, commitment to Lutheran worship, and a heart for missions. 
1850, Lochner was called to be pastor of Trinity Church in Milwaukee after its then pastor, E.G.W. Kyle, had accepted the call to the Bother Congregation of the Missouri Synod in Baltimore. When Lochner, arri Lochner arrived at Trinity, he found there a school teacher by the name of August Lemke, the composer of the ever popular tune, For Lift Up Your Head, She Mighty Gates, which I understand is sometimes referred to as the Missouri Waltz. <laughs> I love that tune, it's what I grew up singing. A major event took place in 1851 when the fourth convention of the Missouri Synod was held in Trinity Church and during Lochner's pastorate there, three daughter congregations were formed, St. Stephen's, Emmanuel, and Bethlehem. In December 1875, Lochner reluctantly accepted a call to Springfield where he taught at the seminary and served as pastor of Trinity Church from 1876 till 1887 when failing health forced him to resign his position and return to Milwaukee. But in Milwaukee, he sufficiently regained his health so that he was able to serve as assistant pastor there until a month before his death. At the Springfield Seminary, Lochner was responsible for teaching the seminarians the liturgy including the liturgical chant. And here is the origin of Lochner's monium opus, Der Hauptgottesdienst der Evangelisch Lutherischen Kirche. Uh, some of this material actually appeared in volume eight of Sinan's theological journal, Lehre und Vera, uh, 1861, the June, July, and August issues. And very interesting, are Lochner's remarks about the situation uh, liturgically in the Springfield congregation. Lochner writes, <clears throat> after 26 years service in one of our old liturgically rich congregations, I was placed into a congregation that was not ready for the old liturgy so that even the chanting at the altar had to remain undone for a time. I could not show my students in my congregational services everything in which I instructed them, but I could give them an example that a Lutheran pastor puts the highest value on good preaching and can wait for liturgical capacity to reach a better form. With great love and enthusiasm for the old liturgy, one can say with St. Paul, in this respect also by God's grace, I know how both to abound and suffer need, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Also interesting are these words from the introduction to Der Hauptgottesdienst. Lochner writes, we are living in a land of rank, reformed sectarianism in a fundamentally reformed country. There will be a growing need to defend the coming generation against the influence of our English Puritan involvement. Furthermore, there is less and less patience and endurance in regard to spiritual exercises. People demand that an already abbreviated service be shortened still more. Again, there is frequently a lack of real liturgical understanding and comprehension, as may be expected under the circumstances, and consequently, no <laughs> desire to retain the liturgical heritage only recently regained. Alas, even the precious doctrine of Christian freedom is no longer applied properly over against the ungodly world, and the spirit of amorality threatens our very existence. As time goes on, there will be an increasing tendency to part with the beautiful ceremonies unhesitatingly, since they are neither commanded nor forbidden. Uh, Lochner wrote that in 1895, and I think we'll all agree that those words are no less relevant uh, in 2019 than they were then. Uh, I notice I am uh, under some time constraint here, 
So uh, let me just uh, do again do a commercial. Uh, I, I encourage all of you, if you don't already have the German edition of Lochner, uh, by all means to buy the English edition when it comes out. It's it's a marvelous resource. Uh, I will try in the briefest. I have about what five minutes left. Ten minutes? Okay, very good. Um, I'll just try to bring a few highlights. Uh, in the introduction, Lochner has a section on vestments. He cites Apology 24. Um, the ceremonies of the public order are retained, the lessons, the vestments, and other similar things. Uh, Lochner describes all the mass vestments, amos, alb, cincture, stole, maniple, treasurable. And he says, it was rationalism which at least in the German Lutheran church did its vandal work, vandalen Arbeit, on the old church vestments in the interest of the improvement of religion in German, religionsverbesserung. Lochner then continues sadly, in the restoration of the old Lutheran liturgy, both for the sake of peace and for other reasons, there can be no question of reintroducing even the surplus, and we must therefore content ourselves with the black gown, which at the time of the founding of our synod was seldom seen in this land of reformed sectarianism. Uh, throughout this book, Lochner shows his intense interest with the music of the liturgy and assumes that both congregation and choir will be actively involved. He provides both the historic Gregorian chant for the pastor's part of the liturgy and also chants from post-Reformation Lutheran resources. Uh, it's interesting for the Gloria, he refers both to the... Uh, familiar glory of Nicholas Decius, a line got into his aero, glory be to God on high, and then the other one uh, supposedly by Luther. He gives some 16th century settings, and he also, interestingly, he provides a setting by Dmitry Bortniansky, whose dates are 1752 to 1825. Uh, he provides uh, tones for the epistle and gospel, but he sadly notes, because of the dominance of rationalism in Germany and of Puritanism and Methodism here, the liturgical chant has generally disappeared and in so many congregations is thought to be something Catholic. For this reason, there can be no question of reintroducing the singing of the pericopes even in places where the singing of the other customary parts of the Mass is customary and can be reintroduced. Uh, Lochner provides uh, a full musical setting for the Nicene Creed. You have that in this handout. If you look uh, on the page 178, there's a musical setting of the Apostles' Creed, and then there is a full setting uh, the music for the Nicene Creed. Uh, I've included that simply, and, and this, of course, comes from several uh, 16th century Lutheran sources, to show that the singing of the creed was the normal practice in the Lutheran church. Either the metrical version was sung, uh, which we have those in the 1941 hymnal, one for the apostles, one for the Nicene Creed, uh, and, or else the actual uh, full melody of, of the creed was sung. Uh, the setting that's here is very similar to what is known as Credo III in the Liber Usualis, also called the Missa de Angelus setting. And it's also interesting, I, I mentioned earlier today that in the late 50s, Concordia Publishing House, and I think this was the influence of Walter Boussin and others, uh, surely. Uh, they published the setting by Hilly Willen, which is used to this day in Redeemer Church in Fort Wayne, uh, the setting by Jan Bender, and then the plain song setting edited by Father Carl Bergen. In all three of those, the full melody of the creed is given. 
in the uh, Willen and Bender setting, the Credo III of Liber Usualis, Missa de Angelus, is given. If you ever watch papal masses, that's the, the song, tune that's usually used. It's a very popular. It's more like folk song than it is Gregorian chant. But then Father Bergen, in his plain song edition of the 1941 hymnal liturgy, he provides what's called the tonus authenticus, the authentic tone, which was the original chant for the Nicene Creed. And that is much more, it, it has much more the, the feeling of the chant. But it's interesting too, Lochner gives the intonations for this. So even when say the metrical version of the Nicene Creed was sung, the pastor would first intone, Ich glaube an einen Gott, or Ich glaube an einen Gott. Then they sing, Wir glauben all an einen Gott. Uh, my grandmother was always annoyed when the organist played the alternative tune in the hymnal. She would look up and glare at him. But anyway, uh, there it is. Uh, Lochner also provides uh, three settings for the Lord's Prayer and the words of consecration. One is designated Luther's, the next is Bugenhagen's, and the third is the Brandenburg-Nuremberg setting. Uh, I commend these to you. The Bugenhagen setting is the setting that was in the Music for the Liturgy published in 1944 and was very familiar in our circles. And interestingly enough, it goes with the setting of the Our Father that we have in LSB. That is the Bugenhagen form of the Our Father. Uh, I grew up hearing those forms, uh, and I sort of miss the, uh, the Bugenhagen setting of the words of institution. Uh, let's see, I'm going to have to close here pretty quickly. Uh, any other comments here? Uh, Lochner also provides an appendix to the book based on a book published in Leipzig in 1886, a book about the church building and its ornaments. That book was entitled The Evangelical Church Building, Advice for Clergy and Friends of Church Art, published in cooperation with member of the Board of Works, Dr. Mattis in Leipzig, and architect Kruser in Berlin by Victor Schulze, professor of theology in Leipzig. It's very interesting, and Lochner provides it because being a reformed sectarian country, uh, it, it was difficult to get our churches built in the way they should be, though they, great success was had. I'll just mention the color use that, that is uh, referred to here. Uh, violet for Advent and Lent, beginning with Septuagesima. Violet for Advent and Lent, beginning with Septuagesima. White for Christmas to Epiphany, Easter, and the three Marian feasts, Purification, Annunciation, Visitation. Green in Epiphany Tide until Septuagesima, until Septuagesima, and in Trinity Tide. Red for Pentecost, Trinity Sunday, St. John the Baptist, and Apostles' Days and black for Good Friday, days of repentance, and for funerals. Uh, some of us remember when that was still the usage. Uh, I just want to refer, uh, earlier today, uh, it was pointed out that it was the English Synod which gave the common service to the Missouri Synod when the English Synod became the English district. Uh, prior to that time, a musical setting of the common service was published uh, in the year 1906. It was edited by a committee which worked in Baltimore. Uh, Dietrich Steffens, pastor of Martini, had a large hand in it. And the book was harmonized by one Lewis Comer, who was a professor of organ music at the Peabody Conservatory. And for a while, he was organist of the congregation I now serve. And this book, too, it provides wonderful settings uh, for, the, uh, the for the common service, excellent settings. Not only the old Scottish chant, Gloria, but one based on 16th century Lutheran resources, uh, which also appeared in the back of the 1912 hymnal. 
So uh, Lochner was, uh, I think, a great man, clearly a great man, saint. Uh, he gave much to our synod. I think the influence of this book no doubt helped in bringing the common service into our circles. So we give thanks for the life and work of Friedrich Lochner.